to the latest in the 3R Sustainability Lead Project Series, Part 7. This is particular to MR, Materials and Resources, for Lead Version 4. Thank you for joining us. My name is Eamon Gary, and I'll be walking you through the presentation. So as I said, this is Part 7. We're documenting the Materials and Resource category, and we'll be analyzing Integrative Process, Sustainable Sites, Location, and Transportation. So my name is Amy Gary, and I work for 3R uh, and SRI. In 1996, SRI became investing in environmental and CSR services with the ISO 14001 standard. We later added health and safety, energy management, and we have many other standards that are now part of our company's commitment to CSR. In 2006, SRI started to incorporate its own internal CSR initiatives with the goal of improving the company and work environment for its employees. In 2008, SRI Green Building Certification was established to perform lead project reviews for the USGBC and GBCI. After establishing a team with various backgrounds in sustainability and built environmental sectors and completing over 5,000 green building projects, 3R was spun off to provide consulting services in CSR and green building. I'm Eamon Gary with 3R, and I've been a lead accredited professional for over 10 years. Throughout my career, I've worked with project teams to document hundreds of lead certified buildings. For the past year, I've been working with lead project reviewer and a consultant for SRI and 3R, working with a team of reviewers that have completed nearly 10,000 project phase reviews. This experience makes us uniquely qualified to have these discussions about lead projects. So what are we going to discuss today? We will have a credit-specific discussion of the prerequisites and credits for the material and resources category in lead version 4, BD and C. We will talk about the requirements of each prerequisite and credit, we will explain what the requirements mean. We will touch on some associated costs with implementing the requirements. And finally, we will highlight some of the important differences between version 3 and version 4 requirements. So what's new in the MR category? This is one of the biggest changes in the version 4 versus version 3. We uh, now look at the credits holistically, and they're designed to focus on the life cycle of the building, from extraction and manufacturing to the transportation, operations, maintenance, and eventually the end life of the building. They're looking at the whole building life cycle assessment, and they're really encouraging the designers to figure out what kind of materials uh, will reduce the embodied energy of the materials and by right-sizing the building structure. Environmental product declarations are also a huge component of this, EPDs, as we'll refer to them later and the material ingredient reporting tools like health product declarations. So EPDs, HPDs would be the, the acronyms for them. They provide the architects and designers information about the contents of the products and the manufacturing process. So the MR category has changed to really focus on the embodied energy of the products, uh, how they've been extracted, how they've been processed, what kind of transportation is inherent in it, the maintenance and disposal of these materials. So they're looking at it very holistically, whereas previously it was very simple, kind of the reusability of it or the recyclability of it. This is looking at it from a very component uh, structure all the way through its life cycle. So, um, Essentially, they're identifying the specific actions that fits into the larger content of a life cycle approach to embodied impact reduction. So the first credit is the prerequisite. This is the only prerequisite that is within the system of uh, materials and resources. And it's important to emphasize that this is, again, very similar to what it was in version three with one important distinction. We're now required to include two of the following, which can be batteries, mercury-containing lamps, and e-waste. They consider this hazardous material, but they do want buildings to, uh, to dispose of it, essentially. So uh, it's also important to point out that for these materials that they consider hazardous, the batteries, mercury-containing lamps, and e-waste, you are required to securely store these within the facility. So when you're documenting this credit, you will be required to show that you have some kind of secure storage associated with it. Uh, documented, other documentation that they require is verification of recycled material types. So similar to version 3, you'll be uh, diverting and uh, uh, recycling glass, metal, paper, corrugated cardboard, and plastics. There will also be the two new hazardous materials that I pointed out earlier. You'll need to document with floor plants to highlight the locations. You also have to document uh, via narrative how often they're picked up so that they can prove that you, know, you are essentially documenting that. 
The other uh, prerequisite is construction and demolition waste management planning. Uh, the idea of this is to reduce construction and demolition waste management. So whereas recycling is a prerequisite that's associated with design, this is a prerequisite associated with construction. So you'll be documenting them, essentially the, the recycled credit first, and then the construction and waste management one second in the construction phase. So for this, you need to develop and implement a construction and demolition management plan. You need to include diversion goals. It can be something as simple as we want to divert 75%. All the way up to you know 95% exemplary level uh, diversion, and you also want to specify the materials that will be separated or commingled. Um, and again, you'll need a copy of a waste management plan as a form of documentation. So there's a credit associated with waste management planning. So you have the prerequisite, which is essentially saying that we will set a goal and we will do it. Now you start earning points for how much you actually did divert. Um, there's one point for 50% diverted with three material streams, so that could be, you know, uh, wood, drywall, you know, uh, concrete, asphalt, all those different things, but you need to identify them. The other thing is two points for 75% diverted, and you have two points for reduction of total waste, no more than 2.5 pounds of square foot of building floor area. Uh, the documentation is the USGBC has created a waste calculator that they, usually, they encourage you to use in version 4. And uh, if, accept, if applicable, you can document the recycling rates for commingled strategies. The next credit is building life cycle impact reduction. And what we're trying to do here is to create an adaptive reuse and optimize of the environmental performance of products and materials. There's a few options here, so I'll quickly go through them. Option one, which is five points, is historic building reuse. You'll be maintaining the existing building structure, envelope, and interior non-structural elements of a historic building. For this option, documentation of the historic designation status is required. So that can be a local designation of historic status, state level designation, but you will need something that says that. Option two, which is also worth five points, is the renovation of an abandoned or blighted building. You need to maintain at least 50% by surface area of the existing building structure, enclosure, and interior structural elements of buildings that meet local criteria of abandoned or are considered blight. Calculations are required to confirm the reused elements. Option three, which is worth two to four points, is building and material reuse, and it entails reuse or salvage building materials from off-site or an on-site as a percentage of the surface of surface area. Points, uh, the points are based on a threshold achieved, and again, calculations to confirm the reused elements are required documentation. Finally, option four, which is three points, is whole building life cycle assessment is for new construction, buildings, or portions of buildings to conduct a life cycle assessment of the project structure and enclosure that demonstrates a minimum of 10% reduction compared with a baseline building in at least three of the six impact categories. Life cycle impact assessment summaries show an output of proposed buildings with percentage change from baseline buildings for all impact indicators and is required to document this credit. Here's a quick summary of uh, the building product disclosures and optimizations. You see there's environmental product declarations, EPDs. There's the sourcing of raw material and material ingredients. So what you're looking at is the EPDs, um, the extraction practices associated with it, uh, ingredient reporting, ingredient optimization, and supply chain optimization. We've highlighted the level of difficulty that we feel. So for example, it's fairly easy to get EPDs for products. I'm not saying all products, but for select products such as steel, um, a lot of different types of you know, carpet, uh, wood products, um, again, a lot of the fasteners and metal-based products, they have EPDs readily available. It's a little bit harder to get multi-attribute optimization, optimize EPDs, and uh, it's extremely difficult to get raw material source and extraction reporting. These are items that are really on the cutting edge of green building documentation, and we probably won't see a a very large uh, amount of these for you know probably two or three years coming up. So for right now, we see a lot of projects are focusing on just EPDs and leadership extraction practices. So to further talk about EPDs, there's a lot going on with this category. I've tried to keep the slide as simple as possible. Um, EPDs are, you know, it, it, I try to hearken it back to LEED in its infancy when they were really pushing the market to kind of document recycled content. At the time, in the early 2000s, it was really difficult to have a product that was going into the building and knowing how recycled it was. So 
if you would lay a, you know a million square feet of carpet you'd have really no concept of how much of that is recycled until you know some of the larger companies like uh, you know, Forbo or uh, the Carpet Rug Institute kind of document this kind of stuff. So uh, EPDs is, again, uh, another example of that. With this credit for option one, you need to use at least 20 differently permanently installed products sourced from at least five different manufacturers that meet one of the disclosure criteria. So you can do product-specific declaration, which counts as a quarter product, or you can use environmental product declarations, which conform to ISO 14025 or EN... 15804 and have a cradle to gate scope. You can do industry wide, which you can consider generic EPDs, uh, products with third party certification type 3, which have external verification, or you can do project specific type 3 EPDs, products with third party certification, which include an external verification. The other option is option 2, which is a multi attribute optimization. Uh, these products comply with one of the following criteria by 50% by cost of the total value of permanently installed products in the pro project. You can do third-party certified project products that demonstrate impact reduction below industry average in at least three of the following categories. These categories are very, very inclusive. Uh, global warming potential, greenhouse gases, depletion of the stratospheric ozone layer, acidification of land and water sources, eutrophication, formation of tropospheric ozone, and depletion of non-renewable energy resources. The products sourced within 100 miles of the project site are valued at 200% of their base contributing cost. They're trying to emphasize using local, well-sourced, attributed products within your building. So here's a couple copies of the acceptable EPDs that are required as documentation. You can see this is an EPD for a single product. This EPD has been reviewed, and this EPD was performed according to ISO 14044. Moving on, for BPDO sourcing of raw materials, you have two options. Option one is raw material source and extraction reporting, and option two is leadership extraction practices. Both are worth one point each. Option one, products sourced from manufacturers with self-declared reports are valued at one half of a product for credit achievement. Third-party verified corporate sustainability reports, CSRs, which include environmental impacts of extraction operations and activities associated with the manufacturer's products and the product supply chain are valued as one whole product. Acceptable CSR frameworks include the following. Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, UN Global Compact, ISO 26000, and USGBC approved programs. Option two is ex essentially extended producer responsibility. So products purchased from a manufacturer, producer, that participate in an extended producer responsibility program or are directly responsible for extended producer responsibility. This is valued at 50% of cost. You can also include bio-based materials. Bio-based products must meet Sustainable Agricultural Network Sustainable Agricultural Standard, wood products. Wood products need to be certified by Forest Stewardship Council or USGBC equivalent and you're valued at 100% at cost. They also account for material reuse. The reuse includes salvaged, refurbished, or reused products, and it's valued at 100% at cost. And recycled content. Recycled content is the sum of post-consumer recycled content plus half, one half of the pre-consumer recycled content based on cost, valued at 100% of your cost. So here's a sample calculation for option two. We see option two is used most common within this uh, credit of sourcing raw materials. You can see essentially we have an MDF core. You can see what percentage of the product by weight, the value of the component. You can see what percentage of the component meets the sustainable criteria for this one for the MDF core. They're looking at pre-consumer recycled content and the location value factor is also included. Therefore, it doubles the sustainable criteria value. Moving on to material ingredients. There are three options here. The first is material ingredient reporting. The second is material ingredient optimization. And the third is product manufacturer supply chain optimization. All three are worth one point. For option one, there are many acceptable label programs that demonstrate compliance. These include HPDs, Cradle to Cradle, Declare Label, ANSI, Furniture Sustainability Standards, Cradle to Cradle Material Health Certificate, and Product Lens Certification. Option two, material ingredient optimization, is green screen version 1.2 benchmark. 
So products that have been fully inventoried chemical ingredients to 100 ppm that have no benchmark one hazard can be assessed with green screen list translator. This is valued at 100% of cost. If all ingredients have undergone a full green screen assessment, you can value it at 150% cost. Cradle to Cradle certified is also a, a form of documentation for this. So the end use products are certified Cradle to Cradle. Products will be valued as followed. Cradle to Cradle version 2 gold, 100% of cost. Cradle to Cradle version 2 platinum, 150% of cost. Cradle to Cradle version 3 silver, 100% of cost. Cradle to Cradle version 3 gold or platinum, 150% of cost. Option three, and we find this by far to be the most difficult of the options in this credit. Um, so for this, products are sourced from product manufacturers who engage in validated and robust safety, health, hazard, and risk programs, which at a minimum document at least 99% by weight of the ingredients used to make the building product or building material, and are sourced from product manufacturers with independent third-party verification of the supply chain So here's an example of uh, the material ingredients associated with, it's a generic one, but it shows you what they're looking for. You can see uh, where they come in cradle to cradle with bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and then you also see a chart that identifies this. So we've talked exclusively about LEED today, but there are other rating systems which pursue different goals, like Living Building Challenge, Well, Passive House, and Bream. While the end goal may be different, using any of these rating systems will serve to document and confirm your building's sustainability pursuits. Every project is different, and while LEED can accommodate most project types, it doesn't fit every project. You may be interested in pursuing a different rating system. If that's the case, give me a call and I'd be happy to talk about your particular situation and which rating system is right for you. SRI and 3R have the experience with the process and the skills needed to help companies be successful in the pursuit of their sustainability goals. And if you're not considering certification, but want to design or improve your building to get maximum benefit, we can help with that too. Although I must say, there's a lot of brand value to be realized from having a lead plaque and what it stands for. So I would highly encourage you to consider certification if at all possible. When you're pursuing lead, you can call us to help. At the very least, make sure you involve someone who can look at your situation and provide a realistic assessment of how you should pursue your lead certification. With the right person on your team, lead certification can be easy and beneficial, both for your financial and environmental commitments. Of course, if we can help in any other way, we have listed some of our other 3R CSR built environment services here. Thank you for attending the last webinar in our lead project series, part seven, materials and resources.